Right. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for that great introduction. Um, I feel like we're already well acquainted. We're friends. You know, we go way back, um, not only Jasmine, but as well as the other um, students who were so kind to meet with me on Wednesday. I've really enjoyed um, my time with all of you, and I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about my research today. Um, and I just want to say again, I'm, I'm really impressed and, and sincerely um, thankful for this opportunity. Um, all of the organizers of the Bridge Scholars Program um, have been great, and I've just been super impressed by this student-led initiative. Okay, there we go. So um, I wanted to start by giving you a roadmap for our discussion today. Um, I'll say in advance that I look forward to receiving your questions, your suggestions, um, because this is a work in progress. Um, the introduction that Jasmine so um, graciously read about me um, represents um, my broad um, program of research, but I will say that, it, you know, this work fits, but it definitely represents kind of one of those branches that where I find myself being um, kind of interested and kind of led down a slightly different path. Um, but it's been really cool and it's been really exciting um, to do this work. So um, I look forward to, to your feedback. I'm going to start by giving you some background information about three areas of health, um, obesity, diabetes, as well as cognition. Um, and then I want to give you a little bit of contextual background regarding the social determinants of health and how they intersect with racial um, health disparities. I will then talk about um, the Neighborhood Atlas, which is a tool that um, I'm really excited about. It's actually pretty cool. Um, I'll tell you more about that um, soon and at that point in the talk, but it's um, a tool that, that I became aware of maybe a little over a year ago and have found it really interesting, um, a really interesting addition to the work that I've been doing. And then I want to talk about two pilot studies, one that's completed, um, the first one um, on physical and cognitive health, and the second one that is in progress now. Um, and then I'll offer some conclusions as well as some future directions. And of course, um, we'll be happy to um, entertain your questions. All right. So the public problem or the public health problem of obesity um, in the United States has been called a public health crisis. One in three adults are overweight. Um, and close to 40% are obese. Um, and these conditions of overweight and obesity are linked to numerous chronic conditions, um, including stroke, um, congestive heart failure, um, as well as um, diabetes. On average, Black Americans are at a higher risk of being overweight or obese. Um, they are more; they are 1.4 times more likely to be obese than non-Latino white Americans, according to the CDC. And Black women have the highest rates overall, with about 80% being overweight or obese. Both obesity and diabetes. Um, again, continue to present this significant public health threat in the United States. And so together, um, these conditions, I would say both separately and conjointly, um, disproportionately burden the African-American community. Although they are preventable, um, these conditions create multifaceted complications that contribute to approximately 200,000 um, deaths annually. And according to the American Diabetes Association, African-Americans are 1.7 times more likely to have diabetes compared to non-Hispanic whites, with 13.2% of all African-Americans over the age of 20 um, being diagnosed with diabetes. So these negative health effects um, of overweight, obesity, or I might say the term um, high adiposity are more detrimental in middle age rather than late life. And so this is demonstrated by two sets of outcomes. 
um, which I wanna talk a little bit more about. The first is um, diabetes incidence, and then of course, cognitive decline and dementia risk. So middle-aged adults are at the highest risk for developing type two diabetes. In 2015, adults aged 45 to 64, so that middle age um, kind of range of the lifespan were most um, were the most diagnosed um, age group for diabetes. So the, C the CDC's National Diabetes Statistics reported that um, approximately 1.5 million new diabetes cases um, among all adults with over 809,000 of those new cases being um, middle-aged adults. And so this is in comparison to 355,000 new cases among your young adults aged 18 to 44, and then 366,000 new cases among older adults um, age 65 and older. So interestingly, um, the relationship overall between adiposity um, and when I say adiposity, um, most often we're talking about BMI or body mass index. That's the most commonly utilized metric, even though it's not perfect. Um, but but the, the literature um, as it relates to BMI and cognitive decline specifically is varied. And, and really that's my area of, of focus, but there's this obesity paradox that is, um, I guess, re relative to other health conditions as well. So um, with regard to cognitive decline, um, the, the literature shows that being overweight or obese or having this higher adiposity is related to both faster and slower cognitive decline, depending on the study and how they measured it. Um, some studies show no relationship at all. But I think the key takeaway is the idea that middle age appears to be kind of that consistent um, part of the lifespan where there are negative health effects um, with regard to the risk associated with being heavier weight. And so with regard specifically to um, the obesity paradox, um, there appears to be this um, protective health benefit of being of higher adiposity as you age, all right? So once you're outside of that middle age range, um, there appears to be some benefit um, with protecting you against cognitive decline as well as mild cognitive impairment. Um, and it, it's interesting that, um, you know, we, again, we often think about um, higher weight or higher adiposity as being something that's negative, but there's a lot of um, inconsistency in the literature around this. Um, with this trend towards there being um, perhaps a protective effect as you get older. So this story, um, I wanted to show this paper, I don't have time to really go into it, but um, basically what, and I apologize for the, for the font if it's difficult to see, but this is a recent paper that we published um, last year in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society um, that focuses in on um, BMI, body mass index, and cognitive decline. And so the story that I'm telling you about obesity, diabetes, cognition, it's further complicated when we think about racial health disparities in rates of cognitive decline and dementia risk, as well as obesity and diabetes. Um, in this paper, um, we looked at um, the MAR sample, the Minority Aging Research Study sample, um, it's a longitudinal study of um, over, I believe, 7,000 African-American older adults. Um, and this is out of um, the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center. But we looked at, um, I'm sorry, I said 7,000, I mean, seven, over 700 um, African-American adults. Um, and so we looked at BMI, um, both at baseline of the study, but then also we looked at instability um, as well. And so we found some very interesting findings when it comes to not only um, this obesity paradox among this um, African-American cohort, but also as it relates to fluctuations or changes in BMI over time, 
being related to cognitive decline. And so I'm funded um, by an NIA um, supplement award to, to work with Lisa Barnes. She's the PI of the, the Mars study. Um, and we're currently working on a paper looking at BMI even more closely. We're looking at BMI trajectories um, before and after MCI or mild cognitive impairment diagnosis in this same sample. So if you're interested in this, um, I'm happy to talk more, but I want to kind of um, again, frame our discussion around this um, interesting idea of context. Um, and so with this background in mind, um, I'd like to ask the question, what about context? Um, and so throughout the remainder of my talk, I want to help us understand these racial and ethnic health disparities that I've mentioned around obesity, diabetes, dementia, cognitive decline, um, but within the context of um, specifically neighborhood um, socioeconomics. So, but first I just want to, many of you I'm sure are familiar with social determinants of health um, framework, but I just wanted to kind of um, frame our discussion in that vein. So according to um, the Healthy People 2030, so now we're in 2030, I remember when Healthy People was, was younger, <laughs> um, but their website gives a nice overview of um, what are social determinants of health. And so as we know, um, these are the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. So social determinants of health can be grouped into five domains and you can see them up here. Um, economic stability, education, access and quality, um, healthcare, access and quality, um, neighborhood and built environment, and then the social and community context. And so these social determinants of health have a major impact obviously on people's health well-being and quality of life. And um, researchers really believe that the, these social determinants of health are a big influence and a big driver of um, the racial health disparities that we see um, in many domains. Um, and so some of these domains that we think about um, are, of course, diabetes, as I mentioned to you, but also more broadly, um, cardiovascular disease rates, and then cognition, dementia, as well as mortality outcomes um, overall. So few, um, despite this, few research studies include substantial numbers of racial or racially diverse samples um, to really examine the influence of the social determinants of health. Um, and they typically fail to explore environmental or contextual factors that may shape many health behaviors. So this leads me to the question of what is the unique role of neighborhood context, specifically in understanding health among aging African-Americans? And um, I will say up front that um, some of my work has looked between race, but much of my work has looked within race um, because I think in order for us to understand health disparities at a deeper level, um, it's useful to be able to look within race so that we're, we're not always looking at mean level differences, but we can maybe look at some process variables, more mechanistic variables within race so that we can really see for those who are doing relatively well or better than others of their same background and experience, then we can see what are the things that are um, promoting health in them. And then specifically the studies that I will discuss today will focus on physical activity um, and obesity um, as well as diabetes. Um, the next steps, which I'll talk about this a little bit um, towards the end of my talk, will be to look at more of the cognitive and dementia outcomes. Okay, so this first study that I'd like to discuss is one that I conducted during my postdoc at Duke. Um, and just to give you a little bit of backstory before I kind of get into the specifics, um, this, is, this study is, is pretty um, near and, and dear to me um, in a lot of ways. Um, I think about 
um, where I was in my training at this point in time. Um, I had been at Duke, I believe for about a year or so. Yeah, I probably had been there about a year. Um, and most of my work up until that point had been secondary data analysis of large data sets where I was able to examine things like health and education um, and how that impacted cognitive aging, cognitive performance, especially in African-American older adults. Um, but I began, and actually before my postdoc, I began to be really interested in um, intervention work, specifically in physical activity and exercise intervention. My dissertation study um, was a health promotion intervention study. The, the, the challenging part of that study, it was a part of a larger um, study, actually three of us um, as graduate students had um, our dissertations kind of flowing out of that larger study, um, but it wasn't a very diverse sample. So in my mind, I wanted to collect some pilot data that would help me to design um, a physical activity um, intervention study, um, specifically focused on African-American older adults. And so for this um, pilot um, collection, um, it, was, it was definitely a shoestring budget. Um, my mentor, I think, gave me like 200, 250 bucks. I think I may have kicked some money in really just to pay participants um, and to um, you know, collect some pilot data that would then feed into a grant application, which it did. But let me get into some of the specifics about this study. So the um, physical and cognitive health pilot study, um, I utilized this to examine, um, or I'm going to be talking about how I've utilized this to examine associations between level of neighborhood socioeconomic disadvantage and self-reported health in this sample of African Americans living in public, low-income public housing. And so this was a cross-sectional design. Um, I, and, and really two separate data collections using the same measures. So the first data collection occurred again while I was still um, in my postdoc. Um, this was in Durham, North Carolina um, in 2012 to 2013. Um, and then um, a few years later, um, decided, hey, you know, I um, had an opportunity to collaborate with a friend um, who's also a colleague in Maryland, and she was um, working at a senior, um, a senior um, housing facility there in Annapolis, Maryland. And so we, we said, hey, why don't we figure out some way to incorporate some research in her um, work? And so I went one summer for a couple of weeks and was able to collect some data together. Um, small pilot sample of 50 people. Um, and so you can see the mean age and education, um, mostly women, um, but all African-Americans. Um, and the, um, I'm not sure if it was on another slide, sorry. Um, I'll tell you the breakdown of the numbers um, for each of the um, locations of the data collection. But these are the measures that we collected. I've added um, this, um, here at the bottom, area deprivation index. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. But again, I was really interested in physical activity as well as physical health um, measures, but I also um, collected um, cognitive status data as well as some cognitive measures. I'm not gonna present the cognitive data. Um, spoiler alert, nothing came out significant. So yeah, it was kind of disappointing because that, that was like my main outcome. <laughs> But I learned a lot from that. But I think um, kind of the moral of the story as we continue to go um, forward is that um, there, there was a lot for us to still um, glean from this work. Okay, so this um, slide presents the three um, housing facilities or, or, or buildings um, that are a part of the Durham Housing Authority. Um, overall, um, the Th Durham Housing Authority owns and manages 17 communities in the greater Durham area, at least that, you know, at the time of data collection, um, that were, was the number of communities. Um, and so I recruited primarily from 
two of these communities. Um, the third one on here, I've inclu I included because I wanna say maybe two or three people I did collect from there, but the majority of people I collected from these two places. So overall, there was a sample of 30 people. Um, here's the age range um, from, a, from 48 to 87. So a wide age range, but I would say overall, most folks were kind of in the um, kind of much younger um, age range. Um, very few were in their 80s. Um, this sample was um, of low to moderate income. Um, and that is really, you know, the, I guess, limitation of collecting from um, a public housing community. You, you have to be low income in order to qualify. Um, the interesting thing about J.J. Henderson is that it's specifically for seniors. So you needed to, to be 65 or older in order to, to qualify to live here. Um, Oldham Towers, Maureen Road, um, really that, there wasn't that age restriction. So the majority of the folks that I um, you know, met with and, and collected data from were from J.J. Henderson. Um, there was a high rate of disability um, substance use and abuse as, as well. Um, I haven't looked at these outcomes in a lot of detail, but um, you know, suffice it to say that that is um, kind of, um, you know, I would say kind of how this sample is biased. Um, and then many, if not, um, you know, most of them were single or divorced or separated. All of them were living alone. And that again, in JJ Henderson, um, that was a requirement specifically. And I did give them, so, so the small, um, I would say, um, you know, bit of money that my mentor gave me as well as that I put in, paid for $10 gift cards for participation. So fast forward, um, like I said, a few years later, um, I collected um, 20 participants um, from Annapolis, Maryland. So this is their um, housing community. Um, again, low income, um, but a bit more physically active. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, but this um, group um, of participants did receive, partly because um, it was a few years later, they did receive $20 for their participation. So we, we did a $20 gift card and these were grocery store gift cards each time. Um, and they um, were a bit more physically active as well as a bit more resourced um, than our Durham participants were. Okay, so this slide shows kind of the, the face of um, the website. Um, I'm gonna talk about this briefly, um, but if you're interested in this work and you're interested in ways that you can apply um, some of this to your own work or to your own data collection or analysis, um, then please, you know, I would, I would highly recommend that you visit this website. It's called the Neighborhood Atlas. Um, this is out of um, the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine, and this is a NIH funded initiative. Um, and it's a really cool, like, you know, you can really like nerd out on this website. Like, it's this online tool. It provides these really kind, kind of beautiful um, maps um, of data, essentially. Um, so it provides this um, ADI um, or Area Deprivation Index score by census block groups or neighborhoods. Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, so each area, again, um, when it comes to these census, um, you know, groupings um, of neighborhoods, um, each of these gets assigned an ADI or um, a, again, an area deprivation index score. Um, and so this um, is a table from Kind et al, um, where it, it shows you all of the, the 17 um, census variables that characterize the socioeconomic status of each geographic unit or census block grouping. And um, among these 17 indicators that make up the ADI, education, poverty, and income are the ones that are weighted the most strongly um, when it comes to ADI. So let's look at um, a few of the maps that you get from the website. I've pulled some screenshots that I wanna show you um, that pertain to 
um, my pilot study. So this first map um, shows North Carolina with all of the ADI percentile rankings by county. Now, I wanna kind of orient you to how the ADI works because it's a bit counterintuitive. So as the legend over here um, on the right indicates, um, rankings at the 51st percentile and higher indicate greater SES disadvantage. So everything is in terms of disadvantage. So higher means more disadvantage. So that's the warmer colors, like the oranges and the reds, all the way up to the most disadvantage, which is this darker red here, right? So you can see throughout North Carolina with these state deci deciles, um, these are counties compared to one another just within North Carolina. We've got a lot of areas of um, high disadvantage. Now the ADI percentile rankings, um, or in this case, decile rank rankings at the 50th and lower um, percentile indicate less SES disadvantage. So these are the cooler colors in blue, like the shades of blue. So just to orient you to where I am and kind of where the capital of North Carolina is, it's here in the center. We call it the heart of Carolina, heart of North Carolina. I live in Durham um, and that's where I collected the, the first part of my data. And then Raleigh, our state capital is also in this area. But you'll, you'll see kind of east, both north and southeast, you know, you've got a lot more disadvantage. This area um, is Greensboro where um, North Carolina A&T is located, my university, um, and then Charlotte is down, yeah, down here. All right, so I'm gonna show you another map. All right, now what I've done is this, these are the national rankings. So now we've compared each um, county to the rest of the United States. And you see how much more red and orange the map becomes. So as you're comparing um, North Carolina census blocks to the rest of the US, you know, it, there's more, there's greater disadvantage. And so this is just a zoomed in picture showing um, Durham County and the surrounding areas. And you'll see that there is some variability here as well, even though on the larger state map, that area generally is more blue. Once you look at these kind of downtown areas of Durham, um, you can see that there is, um, you know, a higher level of disadvantage. All right, let's look at um, Maryland, where my Annapolis um, sample was collected. And you can see how much bluer the state of Maryland map is. These are national percentiles. And then if we zoom in on the Annapolis um, community, you can see that there are much fewer disadvantage, disadvantage block groups here. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some of the results that we found um, with regard to physical activity. So um, this work is um, some that we, presented at the Gerontological Society of America meeting last November. Um, and so we did my um, post back, um, Dexany McCain and I presented a poster on this first aim. And then I did a talk on the second aim that I'm gonna talk about. And so just very um, briefly, um, we were interested in self-reported physical activity. Um, how it was associated with neighborhood context. So those ADI scores that I just showed you, um, and we predicted that higher ADI or lower SES would be related to lower physical activity or associated, I should say, with lower physical activity. This is a sample item from the CHAMPS. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the CHAMPS. Um, it stands for the Community Health Activities Model Program for Seniors. Um, it's a questionnaire, very comprehensive self-report measure 
that was designed for use with community dwelling older adults. Um, but to our knowledge, not much research has examined its use among African American samples. Here's a sample items um, item from the champs. I won't go into it in a, in a great number of detail, um, but um, it's multi it's multifaceted. So there's a yes or no question: Do you do the activity or not? If yes, how many times a week? And then how many total hours a week do you usually do it? And so the nice part about the CHAMPS is that it allows you to calculate met equivalents or metabolic equivalents of various levels of physical activity um, from kind of low, moderate to strenuous activity. And so that was the, the goal here. So um, the results um, from a simple one-way ANOVA showed that the Durham participants in our sample um, living in more disadvantaged neighborhoods had statistically significantly less physical activity than the Annapolis participants. Um, and so we pulled some of the items from the champs. Unfortunately, what I found um, with really both the Durham and Annapolis samples was that many of the items on the champs were not culturally relevant to them. And you can imagine that being the case, partly because of racial ethnic background, but I think also just because of socioeconomic um, background as well. There were items such as like golfing or swimming or um, I forget the other one that was kind of, um, you know, just not something that someone with low resources would do. All right. So um, but we were, you know, we were. Um, kind of excited to see this finding um, even within race, right, that we were able to see that um, being in um, a different, um, you know, SES neighborhood context mattered. And then the second aim focused on self-reported health, pretty much the same question. Um, we predicted that higher ADI or lower SES um, would be um, are associated with poor self-reported health status. And so again, um, simple uh, NOVA results showed that um, the Durham participants living in more disadvantaged neighborhoods had um, worse cardiovascular health, um, self-reported, um, higher depression symptoms, worse sleep quality, and higher alcohol use than the Annapolis participants did. And so from this, um, pilot study, um, there are some conclusions that we are able to draw. Um, these findings suggest that among low-income African-American elders, greater neighborhood, and, you know, we were even kind of thinking about this in terms of state um, socioeconomic disadvantage, um, is associated with less access and therefore lower physical activity and worse self-reported health status. Um, these findings show that there are benefits to living in advantaged neighborhoods, as you might imagine, despite being of lower income status. Um, and then future research, um, you know, should consider neighborhood context as um, an essential variable when assessing health status among aging African Americans. Now, um, you know, this is a small, you know, very modest pilot. Um, sample, but I will say, um, you know, on, for a shoestring budget, it has paid off um, because I was able to use these pilot data for two grant applications. Um, the most recent one um, that was funded last September, and I'm going to talk about that study now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the impacts of race, psychosocial distress, and um, neighborhoods SES context on disease risk. So um, to ad address the, the gaps in, in the research, um, like I said, we were, my, my co-PI and I were recently funded by the Vanderbilt Diabetes Research Training Center and the North Carolina Diabetes Research um, Center to examine relationships between um, neighborhood SES, psychosocial distress, race, and diabetes risk. And so um, unlike the first pilot study that I um, described to you, this study leverages data from an existing national cohort. Um, this is a CDC um, data set. I don't know if you've heard of the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey System or BRFSS. So these data are publicly available. You can go to their website and you can download data files like literally they are on the website. 
um, we've chosen to focus on the North Carolina participants, but these are um, the data are um, collected um, across, I want to say all 50 states as well as um, some of the US territories, I believe. Um, but this is um, a longitudinal study. It's been um, ongoing since 1987. So there's a wealth of data. I don't know that all of the study years are publicly available on the website, but certainly um, you can go pretty far back um, throughout the, the 2000s. And so our specific aims for this research um, first um, is to examine how neighborhood SES context psychosocial distress and BMI. So thinking again, um, more so about um, adiposity um, or obesity in this context are related um, over time. So we wanna look longitudinally at these variables and how they change or track together. Um, and do race and sex moderate these relationships? Um, and then secondly, um, we want to examine um, to what extent um, do neighborhood SES contexts and psychosocial distress predict diabetes incidence for overweight and obese adults. And again, thinking about race and sex. Now here's our conceptual model. Um, it describes the pathway that we hypothesize influences disease risk, um, which is embedded in um, neighborhood context. And that's um, intentionally why we have this blue um, kind of you know, rectang rectangular panel um, kind of underlying the, the pathway. Um, I won't go get into this um, in a ton of detail um, for the sake of time. I do wanna leave some time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, but um, a major premise is that um, advantage neighborhood contexts are um, gonna be associated with positive effects on all of the embedded pathway variables including decreased disease risk, um, while disadvantaged contexts are associated with negative effects, especially increased disease risk, which we have here um, kind of on the right side of the model. And so you'll see here um, that, you know, we've got um, many of the variables that I've, that I've looked at previously um, in my, um, both the, the pilot study that I described to you, as well as some of the other work that, that we talked about earlier, but we're adding some things as well um, that maybe we've given less attention, such as psychosocial distress. And for that, that's things like anxiety, depression, stress, um, as well as coping. Now this um, work is in progress now. Um, I will say that one of the challenges um, that we've been having, so I showed you the pretty maps uh, with ADI, um, the challenge with using ADI for this public data set is that we, um, because it's publicly available, it's all de-identified, so we don't have address data, um, which I feel like we should have anticipated this, um, but we didn't. Um, but we are working through um, kind of a, we're trying to do a workaround. There, there um, is, as a part of the data collection for the BRFSS, um, they, they collect GIS and, and map data. Um, so we are um, going to access those data, but it's looking like we're gonna, um, not gonna be able to pair the ADI data with these data like we had planned. Um, I have a, um, a public health student who's a graduating senior at Elon University, um, and she did her practicum with me um, this semester, um, and she's still working with me now, and um, she's been diligently working hard on this and trying to figure out this whole issue with the data. She's waded through, like, I don't know if any of you have ever gone to the CDC websites to look at any of their, um, you know, public data sets. Um, it's a lot of um, web pages to kind of clicks and everything to kind of wade through. So she's done an excellent job at pulling the data for us. She's contacted our state um, coordinators for the study, like, <laughs> and emailed them and been corresponding with them. So we are hopeful that we'll be able to, um, you know, be able to get at this whole issue around, um, you know, neighborhood context, even if it's not in the way that we had first planned. 
Um, but we feel like this study is innovative in um, several ways. Um, we really are using this social determinants of health um, as well as a health equity framework. Um, we are using this, this lens, which is a perspective that is lacking in the existing literature. Um, and our hope is that it will yield a better understanding of the relationships among neighborhood SES context, um, psychological distress, adiposity, um, as well as race and gender in diabetes outcomes, as well as other um, relevant health outcomes um, for these underserved and marginalized populations where interventions are strongly needed. So we are still very much intervention minded and feel like this work is a necessary precursor to um, future um, behavioral health interventions. And then finally, we're using a culturally relevant approach um, as well as a holistic biopsychosocial model, um, you know, in terms of our conceptual model and thinking about how the different, um, you know, components fit together um, to impact um, disease risk. And so we expect to find, um, similar to the work that I presented earlier, um, that greater psychosocial distress and lower neighborhood SES will be related to um, higher BMI um, in the overweight or obese range over time. And we expect that greater psychosocial distress and lower neighborhood SES will be related to higher incidence of diabetes among those who are overweight and obese. Um, and so, like I said before, um, this work is an important step in thinking about interventions um, in health equity um, from a social justice framework. Um, and our goal is to, again, long-term, um, think about culturally relevant interventions um, to pos positively impact health outcomes. So like I mentioned to you, um, we are um, currently working on this grant um, that was funded. This is um, year one of um, a two-year pilot um, study. And so hopefully we'll be successful um, in getting a second year of funding after um, working on um, some of our initial goals of, of the, the grant project. And we're also in the process of collaborating with um, other colleagues at universities um, in other parts of the country um, to look at the influence of neighborhood SES and to test out our conceptual model in other large data sets. Um, I'll just tell you briefly about another fangirl moment. Um, so the, the ADI, the, the Neighborhood Atlas website that I told you all about earlier. So the um, the PI of that grant, um, her name is Amy Kind and she's at Wisconsin. Well, just last week, one of my colleagues who I'm working with who is at um, Penn State, um, somehow randomly was on some meeting or committee with Amy Kind and was like, hey, we're working on this. And would you be willing to meet with us? And she was like, yes, and let's collaborate. And I was just like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Like the, the whole neighborhood Atlas lady, like she's gonna work with us. So I'm very excited about that. And um, that meeting, we're in the process of scheduling that. And I'm just really like pumped about kind of, um, cause I wanna, I wanna understand it more, um, I think than, than how I, I have been using it right now. And, I think she's got um, the the data that I showed you today actually are from an earlier um, wave or I should say an earlier iteration of the ADI. If you go to that website now, they've updated the scores. Um, so now from 2018 to present, uh, which actually I take that back. I think it's from like the their 2018 scores that capture maybe 2014 to 2018. So now if you were to look at it, the, um, you know, the, the data are, are refreshed on the website, but she's got some other data because um, we've got some older data sets of older African-Americans that we would love to pair the, the neighborhood, um, you know, um, SES data with. And so we're going to talk with her about that. I have several acknowledgments. Um, these are my... Um, especially for the first pilot study, um, folks who I've worked with, um, both my mentor, Keith Whitfield, um, sources of funding, um, and colleagues, um, as well as my students at uh, more than one institution who have worked on those data. And then, um, like I mentioned, my 
co-PI currently, as well as our um, undergraduate research assistant at Elon. Um, I just want to acknowledge them. And that's all I have for you today. Please feel free to um, contact me, um, but I'm, I'm open to, in the time we have left, to, to answer any of your questions. Um, and if I, um, you know, if you would be interested in, in following up, we can do that as well. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I think, you know, I think we're a small enough group, you can just feel free to unmute or um, you're also welcome to post something in the chat and I can read it out for you if you'd rather. I have a question. Um, I'm Emily. Uh, we met the other day. I am yeah. studying um, aging, but in a marmoset monkey model. Uh, mm -hmm. So we look at cognitive decline, but being kind of less familiar, you know, we try to tie our work to the human literature, but uh, somewhat less familiar with it. What would you say are some of the misconceptions that you've seen, be it historical or more recent literature in terms of understanding racial disparities in aging trajectories and, mm -hmm. and uh, the risk factors for pathology? Mm -hmm. um, with regard to, so you, with regard to racial, differences in cognition yeah yeah so it's um that that actually is um part of that question part of what you're asking is what I did my beat my master's thesis on um and it's actually historically a, a sensitive topic to be honest with you um the, the history of race and cognition not only in the U.S. but just in the world in general it, it's very um it's racist um but just it's very it's very tricky um you've probably heard about things like the bell curve and you've heard about eugenics and so all of these folks who um you know had a lot to say about um you know um groups of people particularly blacks um being um inferior genetically um with regard to cognition so the way that um, I guess over time folks have really tried to address those issues or though that, that, that's the backdrop, right? That's the historical context. Um, we've really tried to understand all of the ways in which um, that assessment or that characterization of race and cognition has been just flat out wrong. Um, and so what my master's thesis did, so, so um, one um, researcher that you may have heard of, um, Jennifer Manley, um, her work um, was really influential. Another fangirl kind of moment. I think I was talking about that earlier um, with um, a couple of faculty members. I don't think they were able to be here today, but um, we met and I was telling them how, um, you know, her work was really influential because um, it helped me to frame my thinking around examining race differences in cognitive performance from looking at just mean level differences because we know there's going to be a, a, a level difference to try to understand why. And so, you know, a lot of her early work talked about education quality um, and um, ways that you can approximate quality of education. And so I have a couple of publications, both from my master's and then from some later work where um, I really I defer, my master's tried to kind of replicate her, some of Jennifer Manley's work with um, looking at, um, she used the rat reading, so literacy, it being kind of that proxy for education quality, um, but then also looking at health. So some of the things that I talked about early on today, um, health um, and other metrics around um, education, which um, in that respect, um, a later um, study that I did, we looked at um, education desegregation among um, African-American older adults and looking at kind of attending a, a segregated versus a desegregated school environment and cognitive performance in late life. 
So I think that's kind of where we are as a field is, so understanding all those different factors, um, especially education. Education, I mean, as you know, that's the, the biggest predictor of cognitive aging that we know of um, and how that, as well as other factors, influence the, the um, you know, the way that, that cognition ages and, and cognitive reserve theory also is relevant here. Um, but then also I've tried to bring um, the perspective of health, um, you know, cardiovascular, physical health to the picture. And then now with this work that, you know, I've been talking about today, what's the surrounding neighborhood context when we think about social determinants of health. So um, it's, it's tricky. I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. Um, I, I was meeting with Dr. Is it reading? I think is how you pronounce her name. Um, she was telling me how she's working with actually with Jen Manley on um, a project now where they're looking at race-based norms and kind of like, you know, what's the way forward? Um, she was citing some recent headlines um, where um, retired NFL players are, you know, with CTE are um, experiencing um, some, some of this issue around their deficits being compared um, to folks, um, to, to race-based norms versus regular norms and, and kind of what that means for their um, characterization of the problems that they're having now. So um, I hope that answers your question or kind of at least gives us some things to kind of grapple with. Um, but I think for, you know, in terms of kind of the progression of, of my work, that's really what I've tried to do and how I've approached that, that whole topic, yeah. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I had a question if um, no one else is ready. I, I was think I really, really liked your talk and I was thinking a lot about what the solution would be and just how complicated that is. And yes. <laughs> um, and also the, the scale you would need to, to have something that would really change the lives of people living in mm -hmm. these neighborhoods, you know, in your Durham data that, you know, there's a lack of access to uh, healthy activities, you know, people, they don't have access to gardening, to exercise. Um, I'm guessing like a lack of access to healthy foods and food deserts yeah. and, and sort of, you know, I know lots of labs, they think about their interventions in terms of things that could be done in a clinic, things that could be done in a doctor's office. And with your data, it seemed like things that would need to be done in partnership with a government. It need to be an of academic course. government partnership. And yeah. so, I found myself wondering, you know, if you were in front of like the North Carolina State Assembly, <laughs> in the next budget meeting, uh, you know, right. these funds to inject them into these neighborhoods, even then, I don't even know where no, you would begin. Would, yeah. I wonder if you have an idea of, you know, if you if you could scale up government funds, yeah. whatever you wanted to these housing developments in Durham, what would you do? So, Adam, I'm gonna I'm gonna sidestep your question just a little bit, <laughs> but I'm gonna but I'm gonna try to address it kind of in a roundabout way. So, I don't know if you all saw the um and i referenced this on wednesday for those of you who were at the impacts talk so um i don't know if you saw the um nih director francis collins he he recently came out with a statement talking about how nih wants to address structural and systemic racism in the us and and kind of recognizing that with the pandemic and everything that's gone on um how they've been very diligently addressing, you know, with, with the vaccine and fighting the pandemic, but also recognizing we have another pandemic that we need to fight. Um, I mentioned that because I think you're right. We're not, I, I'm not ready to go in front of um, policymakers and advocate for money. I don't know that we know yet what we need to do for sustainable and for long-term change, but, I'm cautiously optimistic that at least they're, you know, they're planning, NIH is planning some RFAs to come out um, later, I want to say in the next month or so, maybe in April, um, with the earliest possible um, submission date for proposals around addressing systemic racism um, 
both I think in I think it may I feel like you can you probably can pitch it a number of ways whether it's like institutionally or in the community or, or however um, I feel like there's like if not all of the institutes most of them are particip participating in um, this initiative but I almost I feel as though I'm cautiously optimistic that it's got to start with the science first or that we can start with the science and um, and then work our way towards um, kind of some of those policy solutions. I don't know if that answers, but that's kind of, I, I, I preface, like I said, I apologize up front for, <laughs> but I think that's really how we have to do it or how I feel like I, um, you know, would approach it. Final There's time for maybe one more question. Yeah. I don't really have a question per se, but uh, just a comment that like, I really appreciate hearing about this um, neighborhood index and like thinking yeah. creatively about how we can think of disadvantage and like um, going beyond sort of those mean level differences that we sort of know that are going to be there and what are other ways to approximate disadvantage or discrimination and like things like that. I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. And so this is another great way. So I really appreciate hearing you talk about that. Right, no, I, I appreciate that feedback. I, like I said, like the website is, is really, really cool like you, like you can go and just be like really nerdy and like play around with all the maps and of course I put my own address in there and I was like whoa like you know I'm sitting here in <laughs> a very privileged position even within you know um within my own city um and so so yeah I um I encourage you to you know take a look at the the and see if it's something you can both um you can both do individual addresses like in and put them into the website and it'll give you the scores or you can download data from the actual website. And that's what I did for, before they updated the website, I had downloaded, which I'm kind of glad I did, I downloaded the data for the years of my project. And so um, you can use it that way as well. So yeah, thank you, Sangha. Yeah, <laughs> it's so cool. Like it's just, I don't know, the, something about the colors, you know, it's just really fun to look at. All right, well, that's it. I think uh, we can wrap up, but thank you so much. Thank you, um, thank you Dr. Morgan. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, and yeah, I'll be posting a recording of this talk for anyone who wasn't able to be here. And um, yeah, and sorry, 